Well, thank you very much, John, for uh, the kind invite. Well, what I want to do just, you know, today is talk about a, uh, a paper that we just recently published, uh, the first author was Wei Du Hao, who's going to be joining us, I think, at some point in this talk. Uh, he's my PhD student now, he's my postdoc. And the reason I want to present this talk is because I think it fits in nicely with your theme about the microbe mineral interface. But what it also does is I, I want to provide like a bigger perspective, because, you know, one of the things I do, you know, talking about geobiology is trying to convince my colleagues about how important our field is. And I think with a study like this, it's really easy to show just how multifaceted the, the microbe mineral interface actually is. So I'm going to talk basically, I'm going to try and weave a story here about how microbes control basically the geochemistry of, of, of solutes to the oceans. And from that, then they basically can diversify through time. So I'm going to start with a slide that many of you have probably seen before. And it's taken from Tim Lyons' uh, 2014 Nature paper, and it shows the evolution of oxygen on Earth. And the purple line here is the, the classic model invoked by Dick Hall and Jim Castings, where you have very low oxygen until about 2.3 billion years ago. Then you have a, a, an abrupt increase up to about 1% oxygen. It flatlines for most of the uh, Precambrian then until the very end where they have it in the Ediacara, it increases again until we get modern levels. This initial increase is something we call the great oxidation event. So that's basically the time when oxygen enters the atmosphere for the first time. And its concentration is bounded by something we call the sulfur myth cycle. This is something that James Farquhar championed back in 2000. And essentially what it is is that if you have an anoxic atmosphere, so you have a, if you have an atmosphere with high methane, high sulfur, but no oxygen, you get photochemical reactions taking place on the sulfur dioxide, forming things like elemental sulfur and sulfate. And it gives you a specific fractionation that gets recorded as those particles get rained out. However, in the presence of oxygen, what happens is those photochemical reactions are inhibited so that you don't form the sulfur myth. So that sulfur myth is bound by the amount of oxygen you need to basically inhibit the myth, and that's 10 to negative 5 pal present atmospheric levels. Now, since in the last you know, 15 years or so, we've slightly refined this model to show that the great oxidation event actually begins around 2.5. And then we have this thing called oxygen overshoot. This is a term coined by Andre Becker, where you see oxygen levels rise to maybe you know, 10 to 50% of the modern. Then there's a lot of discussion right now about just what happened to the oxygen in the Mesoproterozoic. Some, such as my colleagues, Noah Plavansky and Tim Lyons, would, have, would argue that the oxygen concentrations drop quite a bit. And the reason being is you need a certain level of oxygenation for animal evolution, and we don't get animals evolving until the cryogenian, so oxygen levels were low. So that's the standard model. And I want to focus in on my talk on this thing called the Loma Gundi event. So what event is, and I'm just going to look at the, the figure down in the bottom here. It's a 160 million years time episode in which we have this fractionation of carbon isotopes in limestones. Now, as, as a background, if you take a look at limestones forming in seawater, prior to the great oxidation event, it was basically flatlined at zero. After 2.06, it's flatlined right through to present. But in this period of time between a great oxidation event and this Loma Gundi, we see the periodic rise in, the, in these limestone positive fractionations. And then we have this long period of time, so-called Loma Gundi event. Now, the standard explanation for that is to get a positive fractionation in limestone is that you have to bury a lot of organic carbon. The reason being the organic carbon, the phytoplankton, take up carbon-12. They leave the carbon-13 in the seawater, which then forms the limestone. And to get such a large positive fractionation, you need quite a significant amount of organic carbon burial. Now, how that links to the oxygen overshoot is as follows. One of the ways of increasing oxygen in the atmosphere is basically by burying more organic carbon. So you can imagine if you've got cyanobacteria producing O2 and you've got an aerobic respirer right beside it, the O2 it produces in the biomass gets consumed by the aerobic respirer. So there's a net gain of zero. However, if I produce O2, but I bury my organic carbon so the aerobic respirers can't get to it, I actually end up having an excess of O2 accumulate in the atmosphere. So that's what this Loma Gundi event is. 
And it's also an interesting point of time because we've got these global glaciations, Saronian glaciations in Canada, we've got them in South, South Africa, we've got them in Brazil. So there's an interesting time between a great oxidation event and the Zomagundi event where a lot of different things are happening. And the last thing I want to just point out in this slide, we have these arrows here. These are what Errol Anbar would refer to as whiffs of oxygen. These are transient stages where oxygen might have increased temporarily and then gone back down again. Because remember, the atmosphere is anoxic until the GOA. So they would envision periodic episodes of oxygenation. On the other hand, um, my former student, my grad student, Stephan Lalonde and I wrote this paper in PNAS where we argued that instead it was benthic microbial mats growing on the surface of rocks. So you can imagine they produce O2. That O2 then oxidizes the substrate underneath and you can get an oxidative signal from that. In other words, evidence of oxygen, you know, oxidative signals in a rock record predating the GOE don't necessarily have to be from the atmosphere. But I bring all this up because I want to talk about what caused the Loma Gundy event. Now, I got into this research based on this paper from Robert Fry, who looked at chromium isotopes and banded iron formations through time. And essentially what a banded iron formation is, it's these chemical precipitates that were dominant during the Precambrian. So they're iron and silica rich. So he did the chromium isotopes in iron formations through time. And essentially what he suggested is that wherever you get a positive chromium fractionation, that is indicative of atmospheric O2. So how does that model work? So essentially you start off with chromium in the chromium three state. So this is chromite, the mineral is a common mineral found in you know, mafic, ultramafic rocks. But you also get chromium in things like carboxines and that as well, in amphiboles. So you've got chromium-3. Now, it's not oxygen that directly oxidizes the chromium-3. Instead, it goes through this convoluted system of oxygen oxidizes manganese-2 to manganese-4. Manganese-4 is then the oxidant for chromium-3. So in other words, you need to juxtapose manganese oxide with the chromite. The chromium dissolves, forms chromium-3, gets oxidized to chromate plus 6. That chromate is soluble. It gets carried by streams to the oceans. Now, once in the oceans, that chromium-6 gets instantly re-reduced back to chromium-3 because of all the ferrous iron in the oceans at that time. So one thing to point out for those who don't, who don't really work on the deep time, the Archean, and the Precambrian oceans in general were iron rich. We know that because we have a dominance of these banded iron for, formations, which are you know, rocks that are you know, 40 to 50% iron in them. So that chromium-6 gets instantly reduced by ferrous iron, and it settles out as a ferric chromium hydroxide into the BIF. Now, this step right here, the chromium-3 to chromium-6 oxidation, gives you a positive isotopic fractionation. That's what's recorded in the BIF. So basically, whenever you see a positive fractionation, that would indirectly argue for atmospheric O2. So the reason for I got this into nature is one of the reasons anyhow, is that basically they demonstrated that you would have had O2 in the atmosphere between 2.7 and 2.8. So we're pushing the GOE back 200 to 300 million years. Now, my lab doesn't work on, doesn't do isotopes, but what we do is we do trace element compositions in band and ion formations. So what we were able to do is we want to take a look at the chromium values in iron formations through time. And don't worry about the different colors here, but essentially what we, what we notice is that when you look at the concentration, we normalize the titanium. So basically we want to see, so that's our chromium titanium ratio for continental crust. Anything above that is essentially orthogenic enrichment. What one notices when you look at these iron formation patterns is that you begin to see a ramping up of chromium in iron formations around 2.48 and by 2.45, and then it peaks at 2.32 and then it drops and it never gets high again. Now, one of the really interesting things about what we found in this research is I've mentioned band and ion formations in passing. Once again, the background here is a different kind of band and ion formation where we have the nice bands and these are chemical sediments. And what we mean by that is essentially they have one, less than 1% of lumen in it. So these are chemical precipitates like salt today forming in the ocean. But there's also what we call these dirty bifs or these granular ion formations. These are iron formations that formed near shore. So they've got all these classic features of, you know, of, of, of shallow water settings. They, of course, have high aluminum in it because of all the classic input. So typically, we don't study these when we try to back out seawater composition because they've got a detrital component. 
But the reason I mentioned that is that all of these peaks are associated with the granular ion formations, not with the deeper banded ion formations. In other words, only the near shore settings give us the indication of the chromium. Now, of course, that makes sense, right? Because if the Fry model is right and we produce chromate, that chromate hits the ocean, instantly hits ferrous iron and basically precipitates out near shore. It can't accumulate in deep waters. So from that perspective, this model makes a lot of sense. But the problem we had with this model is it doesn't explain why we don't see peaks at this point, because we've got oxygen in the atmosphere throughout this period of time right here. So why do we not see another chromium peak? So is there another model for that? Now, just as an aside, we've also looked at the chromium concentration in things such as shales, and we see a similar thing of chromium enrichment in shales between the GOE and 2.0. So something during this period of time, the Loma Gundi event, which is this right over here, 2.2 to 2.0, is giving us high chromium in the oceans. So standard mineral stability plot, of, of chromium um, in terms of redox potential and pH. And essentially these species right here are the chromium six and these species below this line are all chromium three. So these are dissolved phases. Now this chromium iron hydroxide is really kind of the, the, the phase that controls solubility of chromium after it's been dissolved from something like chromite. And what it essentially shows is that below a pH of about five, you can have chromium in solution mobilized as chromium three plus or this chromium hydroxide here. And what this figure on the right shows is this is taken from modern streams today. And the take home message, there's a lot of different chromium species here, but just focus on the solid line here. And you can see that as you go from a marine pH of eight all the way to something like a pH of four, we've increased by six orders of magnitude the amount of chromium in solution. In other words, even today, we can increase chromium in solution as chromium three, simply by acidifying the solution. So what I'm getting at then is that chromium thing, that, the chromium peaks we're seeing in a rock record, has it more to do with acidification than it has to do with the oxygenation? So where do you go to study that? Well, many of you will have seen sites like this before. This is just an abandoned mine in, in Cyprus, a copper mine but it's something we call acid mine drainage. You get it anywhere where you expose pyrite from a mining operation, whether it's for ores, whether it's for coal. And what we know from acid mine drainage is that it's microbes that drive the reaction. So really briefly here. So I've got on the Y axis here, I've got the rates of reaction and I've got pH on the X. We take pyrite and we expose it to oxygen. What happens is it begins to dissolve. The ferrous iron dissolves. The sulfide dissolves, but instantly gets oxidized through various different species, ultimately the sulfate, generating some acid. And that's reaction two. Reaction three, now the ferrous iron gets oxidized. It produces ferric iron. That ferric iron instantly hydro hydrolyzes to form ferric hydride. Why this thing is basically flatlined and then it suddenly increases because above pH four, we form ferric hydride. So in other words, as we hydrolyze the ferric iron to ferric hydrite, we drive the reaction from left to right. However, at pHs of less than about 4.5, ferric iron stays soluble. Now, this is super important because it's the ferric iron, once it's in solution, that becomes the major oxidant for acid mine drains, note the 16 protons generated. Now, that's reaction number one. But we've got a problem in terms of how this reaction would work in the absence of microbes. Because in reaction number one, we're consuming ferric iron up here way faster than we're producing it over here. So intuitively, this reaction should stop. But the reason it doesn't is because we've got bacteria like thio, acidophilobacillus that catalyzes reaction number three. That's why we've got the three prime up here. In other words, you can expose pyrites to oxygen to rain, and it's going to oxidize but you would never get the massive amounts of acid mine drainage unless you had bacteria oxidized. So what our suggestion was is that back at 2.32 or post GOE, we get the evolution of chemolithoautotrophic bacteria on land. These are the aerobes. They catalyze pyroxidation and they drop the pH. So how does this all fit together to the chromium story? So you can imagine that you've got a landscape. Now imagine we've got you know, our continental crust, and we've also got all the sediments that are on top of it. 
this is it's, got, it's loaded up with pyrite. Now, pyrite's been stable on the land surface up to this point in time because there's no atmospheric oxygen. Oxygen now gets into the atmosphere via the great oxidation event. We then get the evolution of aerobic respiring bacteria on land. They now oxidize all that pyrite that's been building up for hundreds of millions of years. That creates low pH. So it's basically acid rock drainage. That low pH then dissolves the chromite, mobilizing the chromium-3. So it is an oxygen story in a sense that you need the bacteria that are aerobes, but it's not a direct O2 story in terms of mobilizing chromium. See what I'm saying? So basically, what the role of the bacteria here is simply driving down the pH so that you can then dissolve minerals like chromite. That chromite then gets transported to the oceans. Now, similar to the argument I made that if chromium-6, once it hits seawater, it instantly gets reduced by ferrous iron. You can also imagine if you've got a river or groundwater at pH 5 suddenly coming into contact with seawater, that pH is going to get buffered. Instantly, that chromium precipitates out. Now, at the time, it was probably chromium solubilized or it was sorbed to some kind of a weathering product. Now, some of the blowback I've gotten from this, and rightfully so, is that if I'm going to argue for the acid drainage, I basically need to have the weathering site reasonably proximal to the oceans, right? Because I've got weathering here at pH 4, but my stream can't get buffered too high. So it has to stay pH 4 to 5 to get to the ocean. So I've got to have weathering close to the, the ocean basin. On the other hand, if I can transport it on some kind of an orthogenic mineral, then I'm suddenly golden because now I can go anywhere into the hinterland. So we flagged this idea of reactive weathering products, i.e. clays, but we never followed up. So that's the chromium story, but now I'm gonna get into the phosphate story because one of the implications from this is we argued, okay, so did unprecedented pyrite oxidation lead to increased chromium supply, but also other nutrients? So if I've got all this acidity dissolving things like chromite, I'm also gonna dissolve things like apatite and what other minerals there are, other, other minerals too. So in other words, I'm gonna have not only supply of things like chromium, but also phosphate, other trace elements. Those nutrients get washed into the ocean, triggering primary productivity, i.e. the Loma Gundi event where we have organic carbon burial. So this explains the, the, the concept of how do we get the nutrients to the ocean such that basically we have this high primary productivity. Because up to this point in time, we've talked about the Loma Gundi being high primary productivity, lots of organic carbon gets buried, but we've really not had a mechanism for why was there high, high primary productivity in the first place. So that's our explanation for Lumagundi. And then it just goes hand in hand with the fact that we have the first major gypsum and phosphorite deposits at that time. That's important because to get marine evaporites such as gypsum, you need to have high sulfate, but you didn't have high sulfate unless you get lots of pyrid oxidation on land to give you the sulfate. So that explains these things. So now to bring it back to the phosphate story. So I'm arguing that the chromium was mobilized on land via bacterial oxidation of pyrite that chromium now gets transported by rivers and we get high primary productivity. So a lot of people will have seen this, basically this satellite image before of chlorophyll in the oceans and on land. And I'm just gonna hone in on, on the left-hand side here where we have the chlorophyll in the oceans. So essentially the purple is low chlorophyll, in other words, low primary productivity. The red is high chlorophyll, so high primary productivity. And what you can see, large parts of the oceans don't have much primary productivity at all. But when you get to the continental shelves, you do see high primary productivity where you've got upwelling like off the coast of South America and Namibia and South Africa here, same thing. Up in the Arctic where you have sea ice melting, we have high primary productivity. But one of the real hot spots, the reds, are things such as basically where rivers enter into the ocean. So I'm looking at the Amazon, the Rio Plata. So we've got these estuaries and these deltas where we have high nutrient flux to the ocean, giving us high primary productivity. So we see that in the modern. The question is, should we not expect that also in the past? So instead of looking at chromium now, so essentially that chromium story got it into my head that we have acid rock drainage, but now I'm gonna run with this acid rock drainage and talk about phosphate supply. So other people who've talked about both the Luma Gundi have argued, for example, Andre Becker's argued that you must have had high phosphate supply to the ocean. Fine. But there's never been an understanding of the mechanism that leads to that. It's inherently assumed that the phosphate is solubilized and simply makes it to the ocean. 
But if you take a look at modern rivers, what you find is that very little sulfates actually dissolve. Most phosphate supply to the oceans actually is in the form of suspended particles, whether it be organics, whether it be iron aluminum oxides, or whether it be clays. Now that's today. Now let's jump back to the Precambrian before there's terrestrial plants. That means the only biomass we had on land were microbial mass. So how important DOC and POC, particular organic carbon, and dissolved organic carbon were in transport phosphate? Who knows? Iron oxides and aluminum oxides. Well, iron oxides do exist, but they don't really exist until after the GOE. So we start getting these things such as red beds, we get iron retention and paleosols all after about 2.3. Because remember, there's no oxygen to oxidize the iron on land. So prior to that, we don't really have a lot of iron, hydro iron three hydroxides. Yes, we do have aluminum hydroxides, but only in places where there's high acid weathering in general, right? Because to get something like a kaolinite or a bauxite, you need high weathering. And then of course there's clays. And this is what we're gonna go with. And essentially the work I wanna talk about really briefly now is this paper that Wei Du, who was my PhD student, who's now my postdoc, we, we published earlier this year, talking about how do we transport phosphate from land to the oceans. So just a real brief highlight about clay mineralogy and a lot of you being mineralogists will know way more about this than me, but essentially we've got our three layer clays, right? With two tetrahedral layers and one octahedral layer. And the octahedral layer is typically an aluminum hydroxide, but it can be a magnesium iron hydroxide. And as I'm going to show you later on, a chromium hydroxide. And these different three-layer packets are basically bounded together through cation exchange. So we have these interlayer spaces in which cations basically link this unit to this unit. Then we've got these two-layer clays, things such as kaolinite, which only have one tetrahedral layer and one octahedral layer. And they are linked together through hydrogen bonding. So there's very little interlayer space between these two layer clays. Now, in terms of surface charge, clays tend to have a negative surface charge for a couple of reasons. One, you have these inherent um, unsatisfied charges right at the corners. So this, this um, oxygen right here, which is bound to the silicon, isn't shared with another silicon, so it has an inherent negative charge. But of course, it doesn't stay negatively charged. It's going to bind things like protons and be protonated. So one of the charges, is basically what we call these amphoteric sites. That's the silica and that's the aluminums that basically can either be positively charged. So in other words, ALOH2+, they can be neutrally charged, ALOH, or they can be negatively charged, ALO-. And the same with the silica. So in this particular case, the negative charge is just, and in kaolin, you can see you've got an entire surface here of where you have on the edges where you have these aluminum hydroxides. So that's the amphoteric sites. Then you've also got structural sites, and the structural sites come about when you get in, um, incomplete substitution of cations into the lattice. So for example, you've got the silica tetrahedral layer. If you replace a plus four silicon with a plus three aluminum, you've now got a net negative charge of one. So that's the inherent charge. So all clays have negative charges, either inherent or amphoteric. And indeed, if you take something like a kaolinite, and this is, you know, a lot of people have done this, is just our own data. You take something like kaolinite and you titrate it, what you basically find is it becomes negatively charged as you increase the pH. And what the top part is showing is the two different types of surface charge. These are our amphoteric sites. So these are the aluminum hydroxides or the silicon hydroxide sites. And you can see that a pH below 4.6 is generally positively charged. Then at this pK value here where it's 50-50, now we move into the neutral sites. And at around six and a half, it deprotates again and we get negative sites. So you can see our clays progressively getting negatively charged. This is our inherent structural charge. So it doesn't deprotonate until much later on because if you do this in just a freshwater solution with protons, those protons do not wanna come off because they're basically satisfying a structural charge. But the, the upshot of all this is the clays become negatively charged as the pH goes higher. But we've also got these amphoteric sites that change in terms of their speciation. So what Weidu did is he did a lot of experiments with different clays. We did Mount Marilnite, Illite, and Kaolinite, but we're going to focus on Kaolinite today. We basically, what we did is you take a gram of, of Kaolinite per liter solution, and we basically just put it in, we create this adsorption isothermal, which is treated with different concentrations of phosphate to see how much phosphate is actually sourced. And what one can see is if you take a look at this in the green line here, that's phosphate adsorbed at pH 4, freshwater ionic strength. The blue is pH 6, freshwater ionic strength. The red is pH 8, freshwater ionic strength. And the black is pH 8, seawater ionic strength. 
Clearly from this figure, you can see that the clay binds more phosphate at lower pH under freshwater conditions than marine conditions. So just looking at fresh water, as you go from pH four to pH six to pH eight, you see that basically the amount of phosphate binding diminishes. And interestingly, the change in ionic strength has no bearing on terms of the amount of phosphate bound, which isn't really surprising because remember the kaolinites held pretty tenaciously together through the hydrogen bonding. So there's not those big interlayer spaces which would affect three layer clays. So the next thing we then did is you do a pH edge and you see exactly how phosphate sticks at different pH conditions. And what one can see is that at low pH of three, we bind some phosphate. It ramps up between pH four and five and it progressively decreases. So part of the story is, is that as the clays get negatively charged, they're gonna be less inclined to bind an, an anion such as phosphate, hence the decrease. But why this increase between pH three and pH four? So what's happening here? And what's happening here is essentially you have to take into consideration also the speciation of the phosphate itself. So phosphate itself has different speciations and it progressively deprotonates as the pH goes up as well. So at low pH, essentially we have a positively charged surface and a neutrally charged phosphate, it doesn't bind as much. Then as we get to pH four, we still have a positively charged kaolinite surface, but now we're getting negatively charged phosphate. So you can see why so much phosphate absorbs at this lower, at this lower pH. But progressively as the pH gets higher, more and more phosphate deprotonates, it becomes more anionic. At the same time, the clay is becoming negatively charged. The take home message is kaolinite likes phosphate at low pH, likes it less at high pH. And this is just a nice little schematic of showing how phosphate basically binds. So you can take something like a kaolinite surface, remember an amphoteric site that has different surface charges. And you've got here the positively charged and neutrally charged. You've got your phosphate anion here. We're just gonna imagine it moving over to here and basically reacting, this reacts with that, that reacts with that, and we get a strong inner sphere binding of the phosphates to the kaolinite surface. So we get very strong bonding of that. Now, as a comparison, iron oxides, iron oxides behave in a similar manner. They also have a change in charge, right, from positively charged to neutrally charged to negatively charged. And when you look at phosphate though, what's interesting about phosphate is phosphate binds over a wider range of pH conditions than what we saw it binding to something like kaolinite. And that's because the iron oxide surface still has positive site charges up to higher pHs. So one of the things that then Weidu did that was really clever is we thought, okay, we can demonstrate that phosphate preferentially binds at low pH versus high pH. What happens now if you take a clay that's being transported from land to the ocean as it goes from freshwater conditions suddenly to seawater conditions, what's going to happen? So what Weidu did is he basically loaded up his, his clay with five micromoles of phosphate at freshwater conditions and at pH 4. We stabilize it. And then what we do is we increase the pH. We increase the ionic strength to make it seawater conditions. And what happens with time is we see more and more phosphate desorbs. In other words, the phosphate is now coming off. It's coming off because remember it's pH dependent. So as we increase the pH, the kaolinite is gonna bind less phosphate. And we end up losing about 20 to 30% of the phosphate through this process over a matter of just a few days. Now compare this to where we also did to gibbsite and we did it to, um, this was hematite, I think. And we see essentially it doesn't change very much. Now, why does it not change very much? Because the iron oxides and the aluminum hydroxides are very tenacious in terms of hanging on to that phosphate. It doesn't desorb from the pH the same way as the clays do. But this is why it's also another important point. Remember I showed you in that figure early on when I talked about how phosphate makes it to the oceans and I said that one of the mechanisms is you know, transport on things like aluminum hydroxides, iron hydroxides, that's today, right? In terms of suitability for plankton, in terms of a nutrient source, it's not really all that useful though, if an iron oxide or aluminum oxide is transporting phosphate to the ocean, because when that particle hits seawater, it, the phosphate doesn't desorb, that particle settles out to the seabed. And it's only when it gets buried through diagenesis, for example, iron reduction, do we re-release that phosphate. So there's not an immediate kick for the bacteria. But what we're showing here is that kaolinite, as soon as it hits the oceans, desorbs its phosphate. In other words, we can solubilize phosphate by transporting it along with clays. This is the point, is 
it's one thing to say that you need increased phosphate increase, increases primary productivity, but that phosphate has to be bioavailable. The way it becomes bioavailable is simply transporting the clay phase to the oceans where it then desorbs. So I've got also a PhD student in attendance here, uh, Yu Hao Li. And uh, what Yu Hao did that was also a really, really smart idea is we decided to test whether or not they could actually grow off the phosphate which gets desorbed. So we grew Sinicococcus, a marine cyanobacterium. And once we got to stationary phase, so uh, what's this, day six, we did a split, where basically we let the original population, which had an original phosphate supply of five micromolar, we just let it run its course. And you can see it eventually goes in a death phase. It simply depletes because phosphate gets used up, right? The cells are happy, but some of them die, take their phosphate with them. Eventually, the, the media simply runs out of phosphate. But at day six, we did a split where we then took those cyanobacteria to which we now added phosphate, but we didn't add phosphate in solution. What we did is we added phosphate in association with kale night. So we loaded up our kale night, one gram per liter and the other one's two grams per liter. And by the way, these are low numbers in terms of suspended sediment because you can get all the way up to something like 200 grams per liter in a really turbid river. So we add phosphate to this. And then what we see is that the bacteria actually rebound. And the one with the two grams per liter of phosphate really does well. In other words, the only phosphate supply these guys got was the phosphate that came in with the clay. So we've demonstrated in this particular, at least I think we've demonstrated here, that the cyanobacteria can grow off the phosphate, which is supplied to them via the clays, not in solution. In other words, it's, this is a kind of our proof of principle that phosphate transport by clays is actually useful to the cells themselves. So I leave with this really broad, well, I don't leave, I'm, I got some more things to say, but the, the premise now is, can a river sediment plume like this ultimately lead to enhanced primary productivity, thus giving you something like the Loma Gundi event? So the Loma Gundi event is real. We know there's a carbon isotope fractionation. The general consensus is it must be due to organic carbon burial. So we had high primary productivity. The question is, is how do we explain the primary productivity? Well, I think the GOE story, basically putting oxygen in the atmosphere, leading to pyrid oxidation on land, that transports sulfate, trace metals, and acids to the oceans. It also transports phosphate. This is our mechanism. And then we can take this one step further. So let's bring back the microbes now, because we are talking about the microbe mineral interface. We have basically clays and other suspended sediment transport to the ocean. Phosphate comes off. Our plankton, which are growing on the fringes here, are super happy with the nutrients. But of course, they're also gonna get encrusted in the shales. And we've done experiments that show how, quite how easily it is. It is really simple to take cyanobacteria and completely encrust them in clays. It takes you know, less than one gram per liter to completely encrust them and increase their sedimentation rates. The importance here is that we basically cause the flocculation of these sediment um, cyanobacterial aggregates, increasing the organic carbon deposition to the sediment, giving us things like organic rich shales. It can also lead to banded ion formations. So I'm cheating here. This is not actually a picture of an iron formation. This is not a picture of a red tide, but I'm trying to convey what would abandoned iron formation would look like. Iron being upwelled from the deep sea, precipitating on the shelf. But we also have some of the iron making it to near shore where we form these granular iron formations. Is some of that phosphate supply sourced from the rivers? So, you know, I've, I've got parts here showing that you've got the turbidity. But, you know, as the, as the basically the clastic supply comes into the ocean and it gets carried down shore, right? Some of the phosphates also being evicted offshore, supplying nutrients for these bacteria. How is this once again a microbe story? Well, I've argued a lot in the past about the role of microbes in terms of iron oxidation for BIF, whether it's things such as cyanobacteria, whether it's things such as these photoferrotrophs, these are the anoxygenic bacteria. In either case, the nutrient supply, the iron supply leads bacteria to precipitate the iron oxides. And in fact, this is just a, a paper where we did a really kind of cool calculation of how much trace element um, is in the BIF, and then we tried to parse out how much BIF gets deposited per year and how much trace element was associated with that per year. We then, we then grew these bacteria and we noticed how much trace element they can assimilate. And what we essentially found is that the trace element pattern that some of the cyanobacteria and the photoferrotrophs had mimics that of the BIF. In particular, the photoferrotrophs, these are the purple guys right here, their trace element um, stoichiometry closely mimics that of the BIF. In other words, the take home message there was that a lot of the trace elements in the BIF 
probably came in with the biomass. And two real quick slides, but I just want to drive from the point because as a geologist, I was going to be asked for sure what evidence is there in the rock record of this. One, we can take a look at the ancient soils. These are paleosols. That's what ancient soils are. And look at how weathered they are. And when you take a look at the soils between the GOE and the Loma Gundi event, they have more points clustering up here on this apex. This is the aluminum rich apex. In other words, all the calcium, sodium, magnesium, and potassium have been leached out. We see the same thing here. In other words, the soils which are preserved from that time are more weathered then than they are from before and after. And we can also take a look at the shales at that time. And what we can find is that there's high phosphate concentrations in those black shales at a time. And indeed, we get our very first phosphorite deposits. These are deposits which, uh, with over 5% phosphate per weight. So these are our first significant phosphate deposits. So how does that fit hand in hand? Well, we've just talked about phosphate being transported from land to the oceans, giving us the high primary productivity, organic carbon burial. As that organic carbon, basically the biomass dies and settles out to the sea floor, it gets degraded, releases phosphate, phosphate then becomes incorporated into the sediment. So there was a lot of phosphate at that time because we have a phosphate record of that time. And the last thing I wanted to say about this is once again, bringing it back to a bio story, how does that phosphate eventually form? So, you know, we've worked on the coast in Namibia showing modern phosphorite deposits. This is a classic study by Schultz and Schultz looking at these big bacteria called Thiomargarita. Um, there's also things called Thioploca. And these are bacteria that actively pump out phosphate. And I just want to show under standard, you know, when you take a look at sediment diag diagenesis and you look at the different biochemical reactions that take place, phosphate is libera liberated almost at all those stages microbially, right? So we have biomass settling out. We get aerobic respiration, basically liberates the phosphate from the biomass. We have iron oxides bringing phosphate. Remember I mentioned that before, those iron oxides get reduced to ferrous iron, liberating the phosphate. Any residual iron phases that don't get reduced in the iron reduction zone can get reduced through the sulfate reduction zone from sulfide reacting with that, liberating phosphate. In all cases, we end up with precipitating something like calcium fluorapatite, which is the precursor to apatite. In other words, so that's how you get the phosphorites. So what I'm going to leave with now, and I'm going to have Wadu, if Wadu is here, yeah, yeah, I see him. He's just going to talk very briefly about where we're going with this. But in terms of the phosphate story, we've basically talked about how phosphate gets mobilized from land, gets carried to the ocean, how it leads to primary productivity, how it gets to sediment, and how it ultimately gets transformed back into a phosphate deposit. Everything kind of links together. And although this talk wasn't exclusively about the bacteria mineral interface, I hope I have demonstrated the point that microbes are involved all the way along, all the way along from the original oxidation of the pyrite, all the way to taking those nutrients and bearing the organic carbon. And, you know, some of you will be familiar with the guy hypothesis. You can't help but think there's some truth to it, because on one hand, you've got these cyanobacteria producing O2 in the oceans. That O2 then accumulates in the atmosphere, the great oxidation event, leads to more weathering on land which means more transport of nutrients to the ocean so that cyanobacteria can increase their productivity. So it all kind of goes hand in hand. But I just wanted to end this lecture on a real quick note about what this means in terms of chromium. So I, the chromium story is what got me into this. And from that, I translated it to a phosphate story. But let's bring this full circle and talk about chromium itself and what we see with chromium transport with the clays. So Wadu, if, if you can... Yes. Come on, and if you want to talk about the next three slides. So this is a paper we've currently got EPSL that Wade has been working on. Yeah, thank you very much, Kurt, for introducing me. Uh, my name is Wade, how I'm doing a postdoc with Kurt. It's really my honor today to join this talk. And I'm going to just uh, continue with what Kurt just talked. So in this slide, basically, I want to show how chromium is precipitated on clay minerals. We perform some synchrotron extended X reabsorption fine structure on, uh, for chromium on clay minerals. The experiments were done for all three clay minerals like kaolinite, aeolite, and monomolinite enter pH 6 and pH 8 condition. So if we look at the left figure, we found that the experimental spectrum are pretty much similar for all three clay minerals under two environmental pH condition. And then we transform the spectrum through Fourier function, which is the right figure. And we found the spectrum are pretty much similar as well. So this basically tells us, uh, no matter what clay mineral is, no matter what environmental pH is, 
when chromium is precipitated on clay, the molecular structure is pretty much the same. Next slide, please, Kurt. And then we want to interpret the spectrum. So we develop some molecular model. On the left side, there is a, um, a three layer clay, which has a silicon tetrahedral on the top, aluminum octahedral on the, in the middle, and another silicon tetrahedral at the bottom. When chromium is precipitated on clay surface, surface we found that the chromium atom is gonna replace aluminum atom on the octahedral layer. And if we look at it from another angle, which is on the right side figure, we found that two chromium atoms replace the two aluminum atoms on the octahedral ring. And the third chromium atom connected with the other two chromium atoms through a bidentate uh, binuclear bonding. So this type of bonding environment is pretty stable and the bond strength is way stronger than inner sphere complex and outer sphere complex. Next slide, please, Kurt. And then the next stage, the next step, we want to determine how stable the bonding environment is. So we uh, conducted some adsorption and desorption experiments. For the adsorption experiments, basically we mixed chromium-3 with clay minerals at different environmental pH. If we look at the left side figure, the kaolinite diagram, the blue bar basically tells us at low environmental pH condition, for example, pH 2, pH 3, there is a very low amount of chromium absorbed on kaolinite surfaces. But when environmental pH increases to circumneutral pH, like a pH 5, pH 6, we have almost 100% of chromium precipitated on kaolinite surfaces. And then we did some, we used some chromium spiked clay to do the desorption experiments. Basically, we preload the clay mineral with the chromium-3 and then change the environmental pH from 6 to 2 and see how much chromium is released into the aqueous environment. So if you look at the left side figure again, the kaolinite diagram, the orange bar basically shows that even if we decrease the pH to 2, there are still 80% of chromium remained on kaolinite surfaces. Similar results were found for aeolite, and monomolinite basically shows a pretty high chromium retention capacity for all the tested environmental, uh, for all the tested pH condition. So the take home message of this slide is, when chromium is precipitated on clay minerals, the bonding environment is pretty stable and if the bond is pretty super hard to be broken. Even if we bring the environmental pH down to acid mine drainage pH, like pH 3, pH 2, most of the chromium is still remained on uh, clay surfaces. So I think that's everything from my part. Thank you everyone Thanks, for your so I'm just gonna just leave with the last thought. And so basically what we're saying here is chromium will get mobilized on a clay, but once it gets into the ocean, it stays on the clay. So in other words, that too explains how our chromium gets from land to the ocean. So it can either be solubilized by the low pH, but it also can be transported by clays, not only kaolinite, but montmorillonite and illite, eventually ending up in the ocean, sedimenting out and being deposited with the band ion formations. So thank you very much. Great, thank, thank you. Thank you, Kurt, that was, that's excellent. A, a lovely way to, uh, to finish the, uh, the presentations today. Um, the uh, the questions are coming in a little uh, a little later, <laughs> so uh, we'll give them a few minutes to to, to filter into the chat. To, uh, I, mean, I, I do actually have to leave within five minutes because I have to be somewhere. I have to be at work at ten o'clock. I'm at home right now, so. Oh my goodness! Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I mean, look, just a quick question. I mean, yeah. You know, you, you focused on chrome as an elegant story there. I guess there are other metals that have similar redox activities that that are tracking the chrome as well, or. Is that really Wait, the, say that again? Wait, I, mean, um, I, I guess you know because it's that sort of chrome three, chrome six solubility thing, isn't it? That really helps yeah. you. Are there other metals or or uh, metalloids that are are tracking the chrome in the system as well um, to give you a backup, or is it is it really chrome the one you you have to focus on? Well, we only focus on the chrome because basically we want to just kind of complete the model which I started with originally about you know how does the chromium get into the BIF because we know it does in high concentration. Like I said, people were arguing that, well, if you explain it as being solubilized, you've got a problem because you know, you're gonna buffer your stream pH. 
So clay seemed like the most ideal thing. And I'm just looking actually at the comments and Leanne was saying, why not use iron containing clays? Yeah, we've, we've not used things like chlorite so far. We've, we're moving on to that. We've just started our thing with Mount Merylnite, Elite and Kilnite, but we are doing it more different kinds of clays to see exactly how those clays behave. Because one of the things we want to do is we want to track all the different kinds of, you know, degrees of, of weathering, right? So kaolinite representing the most weathered environment, you know, then illite, smectite, less weathering. And of course we got chlorites in there. So, you know, we went with the extreme weathering condition, but you know, you think of other environments inside of the Loma Gundy event, you look like the PETM, you know, the, the Paleocene, Eocene thermal maximum where we have high amounts of global warming, high phosphate, high kaolin at that time too. There's other times in Earth's history where you should be able to track phosphate supply to the oceans via some kind of a clay vector. Excellent. Thank, thanks, Kurt.